So today we're looking at community from another perspective, the ignoble and the noble community. So shall we begin? Ready, ready? Ready, steady? Ready. <laughs> okay. So monastics, let's say, because this is talking about monastic community, but of course it can apply to any community. There are these two kinds of communities. What two? The community of the noble and the community of the ignoble. And what is the community of the ignoble? Ignoble? Ignoble. The community in which the monastics do not understand as it really is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. <clears throat> this is the cessation of suffering. And this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called the community of the ignoble. And what is the community of the noble? The community in which the monastics understand as it really is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. And this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called the community of the noble. There are these two kinds of communities. Of these two kinds of communities, the community of the noble is foremost. So in a sense then, this is also another definition of what it means to be an Arya, to be a noble person. In other words, anybody from stream entry upwards. So for the stream winner, uh, they're defined as somebody who's actually seen into these four noble truths very, very deeply. and. Uh, seeing the pervasive nature of suffering. It's not only to see that there is some suffering, but it's to see suffering. Uh, pari, how is it? Parinyatam, or parinyatam, which means basically completely, to see the entire breadth and depth and width and span of suffering. Um, and that's what really differentiates a noble person from someone still uh, who hasn't really seen into it deeply. And when you see into the first noble truth deeply, you also simultaneously understand the cause of that suffering, the origin, the arising, and also its cessation and the path, because obviously we have to practice the path in order to see the suffering to its very depth. So that's quite lovely, isn't it? Another definition in a sense of a noble person of a stream winner, or a stream enterer, I prefer. Because we don't really win anything. It sounds a little bit too much like a, a prize. <laughs> well, we have another supporter coming who's actually associated with the Oxford Buddhist Vihara, no? which is nice. Hmm. So this is the first little, uh, little passage. And of course, as usual, you're very unlikely to find a community that contains only one or the other. Uh, normally, you're more likely to find a community that contains only the ignoble. It's quite unusual to find uh, monasteries with stream winners, I have to say, even though that might be, uh, I hope not discouraging for people, but to me, it's actually encouraging because it just shows what a deep insight that really is and how um, profoundly it would change a person. You know? um, because it's so easy these days to hear that everybody's a stream winner and you know, even other monastics have told me such and such came from the veins and they became a stream winner. And I'm like, mm-hmm. So even, you know, people who are kind of very far on the path would never make that claim either about themselves or about anyone else, because it's just not that easy to see. And someone can have very deep insights or some kind of profound life changing experience. But we have to, as Ajahn Brown says, wait for the dust to settle, because it's almost like an explosion in the mind. Something shifts, something's blown. <laughs> View, right, is turned completely the other way around. And it can take time to see if that was really um, what kind of insight that is and which fetters have been overcome. So Ajahn Brown's told me it can take sometimes years, you know, and you have to look and keep checking yourself out and see, OK, you know, how is my conduct basically in line with um, what it would mean to be a stream enterer at this point? So it's not really the point that you are a something. I asked another of my teachers and um, he put it really beautifully. He said something like, uh, uh, it's not that you kind of, 
give yourself a label. It's more like a true practitioner has some profound experiences, but the question they would always ask is, what is still left to let go of? Which I think is much more beautiful, right? Than what have I attained? It's actually the complete opposite. It's like, what is the left still left to let go of? Because we're talking about coming out of suffering, right? We're not talking about becoming something, but we're talking about like actually letting go of our burdens, putting things down. So that's the important thing. So anything you'd like to say about any of that or or any questions from the Mm -hmm. I always think it's it's useful the way the Buddha um, made uh, formulated the four noble truths mm. that um, well hopefully you can always recognize suffering mm. not necessarily obviously mystery. yeah yeah it's yeah. As right. opposed to as opposed to I felt one with God or I experienced uh, unity or something like that. Uh, it's quite yeah. a little bit less um defined and I mean who is to say? But, yeah. but suffering you can you can would imagine you can, right. you can say, Oh that hurt. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. obviously not the case. There's plenty of people who think they're enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> Too many, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. to understand it completely, because we can, there's a difference between this is suffering and I am suffering, you know, because of that. Mm -hmm. To see this is suffering and to see that, you know, what are we adding on to it? Ajahn Brahm often says, like, much of life is, the, much of suffering is what we add on to things. <laughs> mm. um, and sometimes you know realizing that we're still resisting the suffering that means we haven't really understood it we're still kind of claiming it and thinking it's ours mm. find that quite interesting because if we can really like understand suffering there's actually no resistance anymore you know at those mm. times we can let go a little bit and mm. you know just embrace mm. it it's like mm. something mm. falls away mm. at that time does that mean you're not suffering anymore then? Mm. I guess you're not defining yourself by it quite in mm. quite the same way. But it doesn't mm. necessarily mean that, does it? It may mean that mm. it slightly reduces. Mm. Mm. Like you said last week, you don't take it so seriously. You don't take yourself so seriously, mm. perhaps. Any mm. comments, thoughts, questions? disagreements things to add where are all the stream winners though is it just because it's been long since the buddha <laughs> yeah that's a good question i mean we don't know i think there are a lot in myanmar personally i know there's somebody here now from myanmar and um presumably they, they've lived there a while and have probably visited many great monks there people who've been to thailand say there are some there too but i've been to both countries and personally I feel that Burma is much, well, one thing is it's less uh, so-called developed. It's, uh, you know, become less kind of, um, it's less capitalistic, I suppose. And uh, there's still a lot of practice going on. There's also a lot of suffering, a lot of oppression mm -hmm. from the military regime, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And an enormous amount of faith in the Buddha's teachings. Uh, maybe people are more inclined to really, really deeply practice because of that. Maybe it's also because they haven't been influenced so much from the so-called, <laughs> let's just call it the outside of Burma world. Um, and in the case of my own teacher, he ordained at the age of five. And so even though a lot of people do that because of you know, obviously not through their own inclination, but their parents might send them to a monastery. There are some who really take to the meditation as a natural. And their sila has been impeccable their whole life. You know, <laughs> they've never had the entanglement of relationships. They've never had uh, tried drugs or, you know, any of those things. And and they practice. And he was sitting in deep meditation at the age of like 14 for like three days at a time and in deep samadhi. And later, you know, did his studies like they do these advanced degrees in buddhism buddhist studies 
and um, yeah, and had some breakthroughs in his practice through um, through the Pasana practice actually, based on jhana, very deep samadhi. And I don't think he's, although he is unusual, I don't think he's that unusual. I mean, he wasn't very well known outside of Burma because he didn't speak um, English, but it's a kind of word of mouth thing. And I think once you live there, you start meeting quite a few. Yeah, but you can never be 100%, right? Mm -hmm. But there's something about the level they're teaching at and um, what they're embodying mm -hmm. and how they respond, always in line with the dumb and never never kind of framing things in terms of a self or never fixing you in terms of a self. It's very astounding, really. So I don't know that there aren't that many. I guess it's mainly because we don't have the conditions. I wouldn't say it's because... I mean, obviously, if the Buddha's there, that's one massive condition, but it's the other conditions that we need as well, like the the supportive conditions to practice, uh, which is obviously less possible in a kind of neoliberal world. <laughs> yeah, we're so busy with work, with life, with stress. <laughs> Where's the time to practice? You know, some of the sutta say, if you don't have solitude, it's impossible to get, you know, the deep samadhi. And as a result, it's impossible to get the right view. So we do have to have time. Also in Sri Lanka, yeah, in Buddhist countries where there are more people who have the chance to practice, I would say. And the other problem I just want to add, which came to my mind, it should have come earlier, is that there aren't enough bhikkhunis. That's another reason. Yes, it's been a long time since the Buddha, but where are all the bhikkhunis? If there were more, we'd have more, you know, chances, isn't it? If there were more conditions to support bhikkhuni ordination, you'd have double the sangha. <laughs> so we're relying only on the monk sangha generally not that lay people can't become enlightened but it's about the lifestyle that people live and the devotion and commitment they have and it's also about the renunciation as well you know you have to let go of something you're going to be letting go of more than your hair you know <laughs> and your clothing you've got to be letting go of uh, all sorts of ways that we identify and that's incredibly challenging so yeah uh, the renunciation aspect with uh, monastics is definitely mm. stronger. Yeah. What else have we there? You want to read out something? Um, oh, I surprised when you said how, sorry, I just went ahead. Mm. I'll let you do the next one. I was surprised you said how rare stream entries are within monastics. Yeah, again, I mean, it's not 100%. Um, you can't assume that all monastics are stream winners, I think, that or stream entries. I think there are more who maybe think they are, <laughs> perhaps, than who really are. Um, I mean, I, Jim Bromali would agree with that. He actually feels it's much rarer. I think the deeper you go into the suttas and the, the more you practice, actually, the more you realise the depth and scope of the teachings and what a huge, enormous thing that is. To be a straight, It's not a small thing. <laughs> It's like you're destined to become fully enlightened. There's no turning back at all. You've completely destroyed wrong view. The view is perfect. You can never, you know, again, view things in terms of a self. It's a, it's a big thing. And stream entries, in my experience, serve in massive ways. <laughs> they have a huge impact on those around them, generally. That's my experience. What do you think? I don't know that many stream entries. Yeah. <laughs> I feel quite lucky that I know a few, like two or three. But yeah, mostly I've met them in Asia, I have to say. Uh, well, there are people, but it seems that that certain people have just in just the way they are. Mm -hmm have an impact on your mind if they were stream mentors or not i don't know but there is something in their presence that that makes you makes you um, think twice or <laughs> makes you kind of go what was that about so 
whether they were stream mentors or not, I don't know. But what I, I think of is like you could forever be pondering yeah. what mm-hmm. someone else is and what Look. they did. And how do you know that they're stream mentors? Yeah. I kind of have given up because there's a lot of gossip as well. <laughs> I just kind of uh, go by, first of all, what their, their, what, what their reputation is. For a long time, have you heard of this person doing strange things or do people, you know, like their repute, just you could say the gossip, <laughs> but the reputation about so and so over a long period of time. and. Um, in the end, um, if if uh, they're following, if they're if they're in line with the Buddha's teachings, I guess in line with the Buddha's teachings. And for me, there is something about people's presence. If you if whether they're a stream mentor or not, they could they could or couldn't be. They could be teaching in line with the Buddha. But if it helps me, if it helps me to follow the Dhamma and be inspired uh, and see the Dhamma for myself rather than have faith in them, see Mm. the Dhamma for myself clearly, regardless of whether they are a stream mentor or not, then wonderful, (laughs) job done. (laughs) Yeah, please, if you can speak up as much okay. as you can, the other people um, can hear you. So this is Olivia um, from the monastery. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I kind of agree with that because I think mm. the problem can be that looking at um, stream winners, can it could potentially mm. become goal orientated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even if I... I still have every day, I still have every moment and every moment is still precious and special, mm-hmm. even without any attainment. It's still it's still a precious, precious, beautiful thing. And I don't know whether I would be happier if I was a stream winner <laughs> than I am now, because today this moment mm-hmm. can be precious, mm-hmm. is precious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's talking about one's own. Um, that's yeah, it's a different it's kind of other subject, isn't it? It's like looking at ourselves and um, whether that matters to us. Like whether yeah, uh, thinking it's about stream true. winners can be, make the practice become kind of goal oriented for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I do think that you know some teachers, even Ajahn Brown, would probably tell us off in a sense for having this conversation. In a <laughs> sense, not not completely. I think there's something valid about it. I think it's important to know what it is, and what it isn't, um, so we don't overestimate or misjudge or go off on wrong tangents on the path. But at the same time, for me, I mean, when I meet somebody that inspires me, that I do sense their practice is really very much in line with the suttas and. And it has effects that you would hope it would have. Like these people are incredibly compassionate. They don't judge anyone. Uh, they embody kind of kindness. You feel very at ease, very unjudged, very unchallenged around them. Um, it's just inspiring, you know? <laughs> and for me, that's incredible to have such kalyanamitas in my life. Um, people that I can really trust. To go to with my questions and I know that they're the answers are going to be in line with the Dhamma you know but it takes years to figure that out right and you also need to know for yourself by reading the texts and practicing yourself to check them out whether they are in line with the Dhamma so it's always there's always an element of faith involved um, but if you do uh, if you do meet such people, it's incredibly, mm. it's incredibly inspiring. And people are now asking about individuals, which I haven't met, so I cannot possibly say, I would never say. <laughs> I would only ever speak about people I know very closely uh, that I have no personal doubt about. But even then, I wouldn't say I know. Mm. And, you know, because no one can really know another person. Mm. So, uh, you know, it, it's not mm-hmm. about more intense practice or determination. It's about the insight into the Four Noble Truths. Just to answer the question mm-hmm. there. Uh, so the, someone says, the way you describe attaining stream entry is discouraging. I think there you mean that we 
we both think that it's quite rare, yes? Mm. Not the way it's attained, right? Is that right? The fact that we mm. both think it's rarer than other people may think. I have to focus that my practice is about increasing my happiness. Ah, so maybe you're saying that the... Okay, I'll finish this. I have to focus that my practice is about increasing happiness and the happiness of those around me. Absolutely. But what is understanding suffering? It's letting go of suffering. It's finding the path to happiness. It's ex it's just two sides of the same thing. I mean, as suffering diminishes, the happiness increases. So, you know, at times we uh, cultivate the happiness. At other times we um, use that happiness in the mind to have a look at when we're not happy you know, and to see the difference between the happiness that comes from within and the general um, state of mind we have when we're kind of craving or uh, you've got your hand up. So let's come to you. Please unmute. Yes. So I, um, thanks. Um, what, when I hear these conversations, it, it kind of comes across because I, I'm still very goal oriented. So part of wanting to do the practice is to attain something. And so when I hear this, it's like, ooh. And then I get discouraged. Oh, I, sorry, I have to go. I have a customer. Oh, you have to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can always come back and uh, ask it again. <laughs> okay uh okay i think we should move on from this pretty quickly but um because yeah well, maybe it's interesting but mm -hmm. i want it to apply to us as well um stream winners still have greed and hatred but lessened correct me if i'm wrong not necessarily lessened actually until the next stage of um once returning when it's uh lessened but i mean the stage between the two is a little bit nondescript, undefined. Um, so this is what I've learned from my teachers, right? Um, that the state, the next stage is not an actual experience. Like stream winning is an experience that happens, and so is the third stage of um, non-returning. But the second uh, enlightenment stage of once returning is more like, yeah, the greed and hatred lessening. So it's something that happens gradually over time as opposed to suddenly. So it's not always easy to define exactly what that is. So what I would presume and, and sort of uh, theorize is that once you've seen through non-self, seen non-self, um, the greed and hatred will gradually get less intense. Maybe it'll still arise, but it won't last as long. For example, you'll quickly come to your senses because the view is right. But at first, those habits will still be there. Um, so they're only actually overcome by the third stage of enlightenment. So, yeah, they can still have, um, I don't know if you'd call it greed and hate, though, at that point, because they're very strong words. Um, but it's the, yeah, the, the kind of the craving and the aversion would still be there to some extent. And then Eric is asking, is there a difference between being on the path to stream entry versus stream entry? And that is a definite yes. And it's mainly that the stream entry uh, is an experience it's something that happens it's an insight that kind of blows your mind so to speak whereas being on the path it's again harder to define um but basically somebody on the path is bound to get to stream winning so you can't really know that for sure until you have got to the stream entry. you can't really know that you're on the path so that's a hard one to define um, but if you've got a lot of sadha, a lot of faith, a lot of confidence, if your seal is really strong, if you're practicing the path, if your, you know, your view is pretty straight, at least at the preliminary level, and if, um, you know, you are able to still the mind and overcome the hindrances from time to time, then there's a, a chance you may be on the path. It's just that it has to continue because for someone on the path, it's inevitable that they become stream winners. So if you keep falling off the path, then you weren't actually surely on the path. Does that make sense? <laughs> Manori? Yeah, um, I I don't know the English words for these things. It's a kind of notes that I have done, like, you know, about a stream entry. Um, I've, I've written, 
um, no things can be controlled, don't chase past and future, um, life, lives peacefully in the present, no wrong um, views, less cravings, less ego. And then these three words, I don't know in English, um, Sakayaditi, Silabhate Paramasa, and Vichikicha, they don't have it, have them. That's the, the last one I agree. The other ones I think are a little bit speculative, like it's not always the case or necessarily the case and they're not enough to define stream entry. But the last three, yes. The uh, Sakaya Dikti is the view of a self. So the view that there's something permanent in there, that there's like a, a, a person that things are happening to, you know, there's something that feels, there's someone that feels, that perceives, et cetera, rather than there's just perception, there's just feeling, there's just consciousness. So the view of a self, Sakaya Ditti, and uh, not just the body as not self, but the mind as well. This is one mistake people make when they overestimate. They say, well, I know the body's not self. And it's actually been wrongly translated as Sakaya like with body, and that's actually complete mistranslation. It doesn't mean you only know that the body is not self. It means you understand the whole thing is not self. It's a process, a condition process. Uh, and then vichikicca is doubt. You can't have any doubt in the Buddha's teachings anymore. You can't have any doubt in the path anymore because you've actually taken it to a very, very significant point where you've uh, seen the Buddha's teachings for yourself. Right? You've seen Paticca Samapada, you've seen dependent origination. The Buddha says one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. You've seen the Dhamma, it's a massive, massive breakthrough. I mean, in the Dhamma Chaka Sutta, when Kondanya became a stream enterer, the earth shook, the devas rejoiced. <laughs> uh, I think more than just the earth shook, right? All the locusts shook. And they were rejoicing in all the different realms. I mean, it was a massive breakthrough, you know, and it was the first time the Buddha saw that the path can actually be taught mm -hmm. to another mm -hmm. and can have the effects mm -hmm. for them too. So it's a huge, huge thing. So in that sense, they've seen the Dhamma. And then the last one that you mentioned was um, uh, the belief, let's say, that um, through some kind of rites and rituals, one can purify the mind and, and become enlightened. So it's actually less, more common than we think. We all think, oh, we know that's not true. But then people are very attached to their wrong views. <laughs> Even secular Buddhists can be very dogmatic about their secular Buddhist views, which have a lot of um, uh, confirmation bias in there, like a lot of uh, just seeing what they want to see, <laughs> like we all do, right? If we're mm. still not overcome the five hindrances. Mm. Uh, so that one, yeah, although it looks like easier to overcome, I think, a lot of the time we are attached uh, to our particular habits, to our ways of doing things, to our views, etc. Uh, but obviously at the grosser level, it's, you know, believing that you don't really need to practice. You can just pray to the Buddha. You can, uh, you know, bow in the right way, be the perfect non on the outside. And, you know, you're, you're kind of further on the path. That's not the case. It's about the view. So does that make sense? Uh, okay. Do you want to read this one? Oh, isn't that the idea of being a Dhamma Anusari or a Sadda Anusari before becoming a stream enterer? Yeah, there is. Oh, sorry. No, no, oh. that's right. Oh, okay. Um, uh, there is, but the point is at what stage of your Sadda or Dhamma do you become a... a Path. You, do you become on the path? I actually heard a very nice simile that Bhante Sujato once gave of um of being uh someone who is um uh Dhamma Anusari or Sadda Anusari was that uh riding a bicycle to the top of a hill, there's you know, you're in the beginning, you're riding and you're riding and you put a lot of effort in. And if you stop pedaling, mm -hmm. then you're going to just, you know, slide down the hill. But there's a point where you've ridden, ridden so close to the top that you stop pedaling, but you still reach the destination. You still get to the top of the hill. And that is a Dhamma Anusari or a Sadha Anusari that you no longer have to put in that effort mm. but the momentum is is there that 
you get to the destination. Mm, that makes sense. So that is um, obviously very close to the top of the hill. Yeah, mm. very close to the top because you mm. can't go back. Yeah. The causes are so strong that it's inevitable yeah, yeah. that you're, you're yeah. going to the stream entry. Yeah, and just for the people here, in case it wasn't translated, Dhammanasari means someone on the path whose wisdom faculty is strong, strongest, the leading quality. And that a Saddharanusari is someone who's on the path whose uh, quality of confidence and, and faith and devotion to the Buddhist teachings is their main strength. It doesn't mean they don't have wisdom, but it means their, their main strength is the confidence. So that obviously means that they're going to continue. Yeah, The wisdom means you're going to continue too because you can't unsee what you've seen. Um, so both, yeah, I like that, like with, with the momentum, yeah, it becomes inevitable. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty mm. cool. <laughs> is it a gradual or always a sudden experience so i'd say it's both uh a simile that ajahn Brahm gives is like you always see um for example when somebody gets their degree you see photos of them receiving their degree and you know it's kind of sudden they suddenly got it and <laughs> but a lot of work went behind it a lot a lot of preparation a lot of studies and you know import over years and years and years even right back to when they were little at school. Uh, so a lot went behind it. And sometimes in the suttas, it sounds as though the Buddha gave a teaching and then everyone got enlightened. But what they don't talk about is like everything that led up to that. So obviously it's a cultivation, it's a process, it's a gradual path, a gradual training um, of the whole eightfold path and strengthening every factor. But the stream entry itself is an experience and not just oh, I might be a stream entry, I'm not really sure. Like, yeah, it seems like I have less self-view now, but um, I must be a stream entry. It's not like that. It's something that completely turns your world upside down, your view upside down. And Ajahn Brahm always says, it's not something you knew before. You might think, you know, impermanence, suffering mm -hmm. and non-self, but you actually don't until you uh, see it from the perspective without hindrances, basically. Um, where delusion is temporarily overcome and another reason for that is because as long as the hindrances are there we will have this confirmation bias we'll see what we want to see what we expect to see mm. and we won't see what kind of we don't want to see and that challenges our views especially our view of self that's why there can be quite a bit of fear you know when you meditate and the practice starts to go deeper and you you know uh, the sense of self is challenged into letting go of something that it held dear that it cherished and fear arises so that's yeah so these things shake you they're not um things that yeah just sort of mm, maybe i'm a stream winner <laughs> you know if you are yeah it takes time maybe to kind of really figure out how many fetters have dropped away but uh you also know if you're not or you should know if you're not which is why I guess this conversation is valid, you know, even though it might be a lot about goal, it could bring up people's conditioning or fears and anxieties around goal orientedness. But I think it's important to, you know, know the kind of landmarks on the path so that we don't get misled and so that we don't stop our practice prematurely, because that's a great tragedy, right? It's not about wanting to put people down and say, oh, they think they're a stream winner, but they're not, you know, because it's not that. But it's like if you already think that you're out of suffering and yet you're not then you haven't actually experienced the potential the depth of the potential that the buddha's teachings can offer so that's my concern when i hear that you know or when i hear about the jhanas being talked about as very light states of piti sukha that's the first jhana <laughs> you're just not getting the the benefits that you know are offered on the path so that's why it's better to underestimate, if anything, and just keep going. Because there's, you know, imagine the state where you are completely at peace with absolutely everything. And there's no sense of self. There's no clinging. There's absolute utter contentment. That's enormous. So that is the potential that's offered. And we don't need to stop short of that. More importantly, that you will never be reborn. Yes. Because even if you have uh, enormous... Uh, peace and uh, yeah tranquility and uh, for a long 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 time mm. 
potential to be reborn is what is yeah the, yeah the seed is yeah. destroyed mm. seed of craving is destroyed that's right because you can i mean i think there are also people who have that such powerful samadhi they might experience peace and contentment for years eons. you hear about that eons, eons yeah. in the different yeah. realms yeah. but there was a sri lanka monk a famous monk he talks in one of the videos i think uh I think it was a video that Ujagra was in, actually. What did, what did oh. Yeah, no, no, it was um, Pemasiri in Sri Lanka, and he went through a phase of several years of practice where he thought he was finished the job, he thought he'd finished, he had no more greed, hate or delusion, and he tells it very openly. And then one day he was walking on his path and he saw something that he thought was a snake, and he got very scared and he realised, oh gosh, I've made a mistake. I actually haven't done the job and now I have to retrace my steps and find out where I went wrong. So that was like quite a shock to him because he hadn't seen any greed, hate or delusion for a very long time. So this is why I say it takes time to really know what's been overcome, you know. Um, people might get misled into thinking that, yeah, they're further than they are. Yeah. Do you know how he knew? Can you speak up? Do you know how he knew or how, how to retrace yeah. his steps. How to retrace his steps. I guess he had to go through and see where that fear was, why that fear was still arising, because fear can only arise when there's some kind of something to protect, yeah. some kind of sense of self, like for somebody who's fully enlightened, there would be no attachment to uh, or no uh, uh, delusion of a self to protect. So it wouldn't be any fear. <laughs> so I guess he realized he hadn't fully overcome that. I mean, it doesn't mean he wasn't um, a stream winner. He could have been, you know, he could have been fairly far on the path, but the fear, he wasn't an arahat. He wasn't fully enlightened. He probably wasn't an anagami either for that matter, because there too, like, uh, aversion and craving were overcome. So how he did it, I mean, there is a little clip in that video I mentioned, but I don't think it's publicly available. But he definitely had something to say about mindfulness mm. and his understanding of mindfulness that clarified a lot through that. Um, and I forget what it was, honestly. I'd have to find the film. We could what we could try and find it and watch it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so um Mukun's asking, was it Venerable Napane Pemasiri? I don't know his first name, was I it? He he's the very he's famous, famous, very famous he's still alive. Very famous the the I don't know who Napane yeah. famous series is, but this is the well-known famous yeah, series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one who um, is still alive. To, I can't remember the name of the monastery. Ah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So Erika said, I just remembered I was reading the Majima Agama. That's the parallel to the Majima Nikaya. And getting to discuss the Dhamma, Dhamma Sakacha, is a support for making a breakthrough in the Dhamma. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hearing the Dhamma, first of all, absolutely fundamentally required. And getting to discuss the Dhamma is enormously helpful, which is why I like to have these sort of discussion groups, because it makes us think uh, and try and clarify our understanding, even if we don't get quite at it. You can't quite get at it just through Dhamma conversation, but it can incite a certain enthusiasm to keep exploring, to keep practicing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's super helpful. <laughs> okay. You're welcome, Diana, to be late. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more questions while we, well, we've spent almost the whole talk <laughs> talking about stages on the path, <laughs> speculating <laughs> to a degree and also some of it informed. <laughs> Anything else on those things? Does it matter? Is it important? Do people get inspired or? Any thoughts? <laughs> is it inspiring to hear it's quite a deep stage and it's quite a profound shift or is it disappointing and discouraging? <laughs> Grace says it helps to remember the aim just so that you can uh, hear. Erica feels inspired. Kim, it's too remote. <laughs> but we can see a gradual lessening of suffering, even in a moment, right? Diana. 
Diana, can I ask you to unmute, please? Hi. Hi, Diana. Hi, Vinchanda. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. You too. Um, I found in my life of practice that striving for states has led to a lot of suffering and knowing that the states are there makes it hard not to want to experience them and when i do experience something extraordinary then i want to experience it again and then when i don't i think i'm doing something wrong and it's just for me going around and around of letting go of that craving and then having it come up again and thinking it's under control or I'm not really craving it, it just would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wonder if you could speak a little about that process and how to be free of it. I don't know, like it just, I have noticed it come coming back. Right, right. Yeah, my first thought when you said it actually was like, uh, it's that desire it, in a sense it's like noticing it and then kind of not wanting it right wanting to be free of it wanting to be rid of it and yet actually I think it's very very valuable to see that um I mean if we didn't talk about these things because the Buddha obviously did then would we have the chance to see that that striving for goals and attainments I mean we can't pretend there aren't any so if it uncovers our clinging and our kind of striving then yeah, it's showing us something about ourselves. Maybe there's a slightly wrong angle that we're coming at it with, you know, rather than um, just taking the positive side, which could be the inspiration. We're also, you know, getting the craving coming up, which is natural as long as we're not, um, you know, even anagamis, I guess. Even anagamis, they still have uh, not attachment, but they still have this delighting in jhanas and things like that, even though they know it's not as sublime as nirvana they still have that you know so it's a very long process and i don't think we should um criticize ourselves for that or feel that we better not talk about it because of that um i mean it might be wise not to dwell on it <laughs> and to maybe listen to dhamma in general that um focuses on the process and not the goal but uh i think it's very valuable that you're seeing that process i don't know if that and something. Do you still have your hand up to say more? Gunta, can you unmute yeah, that? I, I, I muted myself while you were speaking yeah. and I couldn't unmute. Um, yeah, I, I did a retreat online a couple of years ago with a teacher who accepts light jhana. Yeah. <laughs> as um jhanas and he was like oh yes you're having that's this jhana that's this jhana and i got kind of happy about that not not puffed up or anything but just like oh good i'm a, i'm getting somewhere with this you know like i was looking at it in the wrong way but then i talked to my other teacher who you know <laughs> and he's like well i don't really think it is <laughs> and i just kind of got so dejected like <laughs> I thought I was getting somewhere. Now I'm not getting anywhere. And it kind of put me off the whole wanting to sit. Like, and that's just an old program of, you know, attainment based right. Right, right, right. living, basically. Like, you know, I'm going for this goal, now that goal, now that goal. No, I need to go back to the beginning. It's like I did return to go, pa do not pass go, <laughs> do not collect a jhana. So anyway, that, that yeah, happened. I mean, this is the danger in teaching stages, I have to say, especially in missed teaching stages, um, you know, I mean, which is why I think Ajahn Brahm is so skillful, because he doesn't dilute them, but he does talk about them as stages of letting go. And he also talk, really very much focuses on the process and on the kindness and on making every moment a moment of kindness. Um, so to me, it's like it actually undermines God or striving for anything. Um, and the irony with that, isn't it, is that if you had got benefit from that, you would, you know, if it's genuine benefit, whether someone says it's jhana or not, so right. what? It's still benefit. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, why do we That's need to have that name on it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 
uh, see that can happen though because it also shows me how tempting it really is to go to these teachers because it does give a boost but can we get that boost anyway somehow by being content with little i mean probably not that little Mukund, can we Mukund, uh, can i ask you to unmute please yes thank you so much um so, so to me, I think this the, the point you just made about thinking of it as stages of letting go is actually useful because then it says something about what do I need to do next or what do I need to focus on? But to be very honest, the rest of it felt like a distraction. I mean, if it doesn't make a difference, I mean, if it's just the next step, you, you need to anyway take the next step, right? Whatever it is, right, uh, irrespective right. of where you are. So uh, to the extent that clarifies the next step, it's very, very helpful. Otherwise, it feels like a distraction, to be honest. I know what you mean. That's what I was also cautious about. It's like, are we just talking about it for intellectual kind of entertainment? I mean, obviously, it's good to be clear on what these things are. But yeah, it can kind of miss the point of, of uh, the steps we have to take now. And just to bring it even closer to home, I'd say forget about the next step. Forget about the next thing you have to do. It's more, you know, what can I let go of now, right now? So it's always bringing it home to this moment. Yeah. So what else was there at the top? Just so we don't miss any of these comments. So I think that's Minori. Ah, okay. Neon. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to read names. Uh, so someone says inspiring to keep in mind. Someone else says it can be a bit intimidating, but it helps to remember to stay with the practice, I think. Yay. I think so. Can. Yes, it's inspiring. There are people who are losing themselves, <laughs> their delusions in the present day, encouraging to carry on one's practice. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. I find it amazing that there are such people because when I kind of contemplate what it really means, it's just un unbelievable, actually. It's not a small thing. You realize this when you meet such people because there's something extraordinary. It can feel remote, but one hopes that being on the path now will help us on it as we move through samsara in the long run. Yeah. The Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi says, there's only two things you need for enlightenment, to start walking on the path and <laughs> to continue. <laughs> Which is great. It really brings it back to the, to the basics. So yeah, imagine how it would feel if we didn't even have a path. Oh my goodness. I would be dead. It's inspiring, but more questions come up in the mind. Self view is stronger comparing to other fetters. Yeah. Attachment to rites and rituals or doubt about the Dhamma. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, right view is like a big deal. That's the first factor of the path. It's a path factor, right? The others aren't path factors. So, yeah, the self view. And, uh, you know, my main practice used to be on contemplating impermanence, but, um, now I have a feeling that uh, working on undermining the sense of self is actually even more effective to, to make that breakthrough, which is why the emphasis on process, because process is one of the things that can undermine the sense of there being something like essential, solid, right? If things are just in a process, <laughs> cause and effect, that starts to get at the sense of self. It starts to undermine it um so yeah the way we approach the practice you know not me that wants to attain something but a kind of noticing cause and effect in one's practice putting the causes in place and waiting for the results just allowing the results to to happen in their own time um, it does make me a little nervous knowing how difficult it is to attain stream entry considering how rare human birth is and that uncertain and that uncertain that we will be able to continue working on this path in the next rebirth yeah yeah i think that was the buddha's intention mm. so you'd say ah i need to <laughs> i need to shave my hair <laughs> put on the robes or at least you know make more time to meditate <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i think he said that a lot huh how rare the human Birth is mm. true. What do you think? 
true. And even though we think, you know, I have so much faith in the Dhamma, I will never leave this. Yeah. I can't imagine anything else other than this. In, in truth, we don't have faith until we are a stream and uh, not unshakable, not unshakable faith. So Correct. I would like to think that in my next life, I yeah. will be nothing except wanting to walk this path. But yeah, that is shakable. We so, have a mixed karma. Yeah, we have mixed karma. Yeah, that's a nice way of saying it. we have mixed karma. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, but the more you practice now, <laughs> the more you incline, the more likely you'll continue. Yeah, yeah, that's it's right. true. Actually, that's I've true. become a bit positive, more positive. Mm. Like that. Oh yeah, you know, if mm. I'm practicing now, I'll definitely mm. be practicing mm. again in the next life. Mm. But actually, we don't want a next life, and you can't take it for granted. Yeah, mm. I mean, anyone who's not a stream when I can mm. or a stream enter. Don't know why I keep saying winner. I saw it written. Mm. Stream entry, maybe I want to win it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, you can still get to the lower realms. Yeah. Mm. So, but I mean, the, but in the end, but the, but the best, the only thing we can do is keep practicing. Yeah. So, either way, I think in the end, it all comes out okay. I, I hope I'm not too positive, but even Devadatta, he did really awful things like try to kill the Buddha, which is unbelievably major. So, he actually, um, basically destroyed his chance of stream winning in that life well, someone else who, oh yeah uh ajatasattu he killed his father <laughs> he destroyed his chance and the buddha actually gave him a talk and said if he hadn't killed his father he would have got stream in entry there and then but tough he'd done it but in the case of devadatta um and no one here has tried to kill the buddha or tried to kill their father i hope mm. But in the case of Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin, the Buddha actually said that in a future life, he'll be a Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. He'll be a, a Buddha or a Pachyoti oh, Buddha. Uh, I think, yeah, he'll go. He'll, he'll, I think oh. he'll be enlightened anyway. He said he'll uh, be a Buddha, didn't he? In a future yeah, life. Yeah, There's, yeah. There's was that in the Sutta? Buddha, I think. Pachyoti Buddha. Yeah. Because there's, yeah, like such mixed karma in all of mm. us. I mean, I personally mm. think if we're here, Mm. having access to the dhamma mm. there's something already it's incredible yeah how many people in this world have this mm. i know this is not the only sort of class online but still it's available to everyone in the world there's only 28 of us or actually 30 mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing you know that we mm. actually have this much interest and want to hear it despite the way it challenges the sense of self it challenges it in both ways like either we don't you know, want to hear it, or we actually don't like the fact that it shows us that we have a sense of self, <laughs> but we still listen anyway. That's pretty cool. Mm. I have to say, Ajahn Brahm is very positive. So oh, he says, you know, you've heard the Dhamma, you can't forget it now. Mm, he does. You can't un I, you can't forget this now. Yeah. <laughs> I think at a certain point it's true. You can't unsee it. Yeah. But the thing is, we don't know for sure. I mean, we might be on the path, any of us here. But until we actually get the stream entry. Basically, don't be complacent. Just keep practicing. We don't worry about it. Do it chill. Mm. <laughs> Manoli, do you want to add yeah, something? Just one little simile that I heard a couple of days back in a Dhamma talk. I thought it'll be really nice for everybody. Uh, it says, so imagine... There's this person who's cutting a forest and trying to make this little road to go from one place to the other place. And they cut and cut and after a while, forget about it and then goes back. And then after, so when he cuts, he'll you know, remove the huge trees, small trees, boulders, all that, and very, very carefully cut it to a place. And then he forget about it after a couple of years, come back. And then the, the the forest has grown, but it is easier to cut to the same to the previous place because there are no big boulders, there are no big trees. So you get into that place, and after that you continue. So whatever what the simile says, whatever you have done in the path, so later in a couple of lifetimes, maybe you come back to this, you hear this, and you sit in the cushion, probably you'll get into a state that you have you know come up you worked you know easily and after that you continue wherever you stopped so I thought it was quite 
encouraging because I was kind of feeling the same as Casey, like, you know, this is so scary that the next Bauer person can totally do, do a U-turn kind of thing. So when I heard this, it was quite encouraging. Yeah, and, and, you know, actually any way of looking, it's just a kind of perspective, you know, so maybe it's better to take the ones that do encourage because the whole purpose mm. of these discussions, the whole purpose of, you know, the practice and mm. is to encourage ourselves isn't it it's to like inspire to give us you know something to uh yeah inspire us to live really beautiful lives aligned with the dhamma as much as we can so yeah and sometimes it might be good to also think actually i could do a bit more you know let's not be complacent here i don't think the buddha means to terrify us necessarily because it's not a fear-based religion but uh, yeah, take whatever perspective really helps you to feel inspired. Yeah, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. simile. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. very helpful. I mean, the Buddha says, right? Whatever you frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of your mind. Mm -hmm. So that means if you frequently reflect and ponder upon Dhamma, you're going to keep doing it. It's a habit mm -hmm. like everything else. You make mm -hmm. a habit. Mm -hmm. If you meditate every day, Mm. you're more likely to do the next day if you miss one you're probably more likely to notice the detrimental effect you know the more we get inclined to happiness the less likely we are to start kind of plundering it by doing things that you know obscure that happiness or mm. cause a decline in our virtue you want to go for this oh. a tangential point the Buddha mentioned that the path is beneficial in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. What is the is it Pali, I guess. Pali original quote and where is it from? Is this the same as the idea of the Dhamma being open aiko? So I know it now. Uh, uh, <laughs> um Kalyana, isn't it? Oh uh, yeah. Kalyana, Majjima Kalyana. Yeah, and uh, Patima or something. Yeah, beneficial in the beginning. Yeah, Kalyana is the word. Mm. And mm. so, yeah. Where Majjima is it? It's, it's quite common, isn't it? But I can't really Second remember where it is. Central, yeah, Central, Central. 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 That's a good way to get yeah. out of it. <laughs> is it the same yeah. as the idea of the Dhamma being Upanayiko? Mm. Slightly different, um, isn't it? Openaiko is, Openaiko like, is like, uh, isn't it leading inward or leading onward? Some people say leading onward, but I always think it means leading inward. I just like that better. It makes more sense to me. No, apparently here now is a Santitiko. Yeah, Openaiko is like uh, leading onward. I mean, in a sense, yes, like it leads, it's a progressive path, we can say. I mean, I like how Ajahn Pramali mm. puts it. He says that it's like mm. a gradual training in ever-increasing bliss or something. I'm, I'm probably mm. misquoting, mm -hmm. but something like a, a gradual refinement of wholesome happiness. I like that. <laughs> mm. So in that sense, yeah, like it, the beginning you could see as having confidence and keeping the precepts, that gives a certain kind of happiness. Mm. But then you take it further with the sense of mm. strength, that gives a more subtle and stable kind of happiness and then you have like the happiness of being aware being mindful having energy in the mind and then you have the happiness of like um yeah what's the other happinesses you have the happiness of um even before jhanas you know just with the pt sukha the kind of wholesome joy and bliss that can arise in the body and then you have the tranquility then you have the real strong sukha which is like deep contentment and more ease and then you have the happiness of peace, like the stillness of samadhi, which is deeper still. And then the highest happiness is like, well, even before that, there's the happiness of wisdom. When defilements like actually get completely undercut, that's a deeper happiness. Yeah, Kalyana. Yeah, Kalyana. Kalyana. yeah. Anyway, and then thank you, Adrian. Yay. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the happiness of Nibbana. So in that sense, it's good in the beginning, middle and end. Sean. Sean, may I ask you to unmute, please? 
Hello, yeah. Um, I just thought I'd share an experience I had this week where I had I was a lot had a lot of suffering. Something happened, um, and I didn't know how to deal with the situation. And I had been listening. I was listening to some talks uh, from Ajahn Brahmali. I was meditating a lot with a lot of metas using the online um, Venerable Chanders online uh meta uh, meditations which really helped because i was quite caught in my head and then i looked at the suttas in terms of what to say to people the right speech and it all just kind of came together like i obviously there was still suffering there but in the past i would have reacted much worse much less skillfully and i just thought i'd share that experience because you know we're talking about things that for me at least are extremely far off but to me it doesn't really matter at this point because I've got so much benefit from that and and then I for example one thing was I did I wrote an email and I wrote it in a very thought out way and I was worried so when I sent it I wasn't worried about the reply and when I got the reply it was a nice reply back and it deflated oh. what could have been a worse situation so it was just a really nice experience where everything came together really yeah. so you said first you listen to the dharma talk then the meta meditation then the suttas yeah yeah all of it so it's yeah. like everything working and yeah all really helped We have to look at our own lives, don't we, and see like how does it help us? Yeah. And actually, you say you're far away. We don't know, and it's not even a much point kind of trying to figure that out. Actually, it is all about you know how can we apply it right now. Uh, you don't know how close or far you are. I mean, from what anyway? We don't even know from what, right? Because we don't really know how it'll be. So, yeah. I also and I also remember that it is not some it's it is not a place you're going to, but it's uncovering uncovering mm -hmm. what is already there. Like it is the purity, purifying your mind as opposed to going to a place that you don't, you know, it's removing the hindrances. Mm -hmm. So it's right, all, your mind is already pure. It's just is covered it? up. It's covered mm. up by the, by the hindrances. Mm. Two point. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. It's a letting go of what's obscuring mm. Mm. our happiness. Let's mm. say, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So on that note, <laughs> it's close to the end of the session, and uh, totally different from. Any think? thought I might have had. I didn't have any plan because I hadn't opened the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> I didn't expect that we'd talk all about those sorts of challenging things. In a way, challenging, right? Because in a way, we're all a bit like, yeah, we can have a sense. We can have an understanding of what the Buddha's saying. But really, these have things have to be experienced. And I think that's, you know, that's the important thing. But hopefully it can whet our appetites to uh, and not think of them as something that's kind of obscure and unattainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some countries, even Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka, apparently people think you can't become enlightened in these days. Well, actually, a lot of was, people think that. It, it flipped. Did it flip? It and now flipped. they think everyone can. Yes. Right. But that's just a reaction, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so neither's true. <laughs> Here we are. We'll read the last quote. Here we go. From Erica, thank you. Just like the baby calf who's just been born, but urged on by its mother's lowing, still managed to cross the Ganges to safety, are the mendicants who are followers of principles, or, or yeah, in other words, dhamma followers, or followers by faith, confidence. They too, having breasted Mara's stream, whose translation is this? <laughs> Uh, we'll safely cross over to the far shore, Ajahn Sajata. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, mendicants. I should have recognized. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. Just little baby cows. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's really nice. Oh, okay. So whoever would like to give little um, words at the end and please um, unpin us and pin yourself. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I want to start with the bad news. In uh, Buddhism, you cannot uh, buy yourself stream entrance, um, but you can still make a um, good deed by uh, giving dana or donations for the uh, um, Vihaga we have uh, now in Oxford, and which is more and more active and full of people. Um, also, Venerable Chanda and her guests um, are dependent on food. So there is an afar and aha for <laughs> uh, um, all food on the uh, all hands for food and for for I'll for write it in Gunter. Yeah. Um, um, if you're interested in uh, joining these workshop groups, uh, you can email team at um, project.org. Um, yeah, so there is money donations or help and uh, food donations, um, Dana, um, which are needed to establish more and more our Vihara now in, in Oxford, our Vihara now. Thank you. Trying to pin ourselves. I think I did it. I think I pinned Gunter and now pinned us. So hopefully that worked. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure there's something else I should say. I mean, one thing I guess is that Ajahn Pramali is coming and uh, yeah, and uh, there's still a lot of places in the talk. So please sign up so that we uh, don't worry and make thousands of posters and <laughs> get everyone to circulate it like crazy. Um, so please sign up. And if you have volunteer time to come to the events and to be on the tickets, please let us know as well. You can write to team at anukampoproject.org. And uh, also, there's a chance to offer a weekly supermarket shop. I'm not sure if going to mention that or not, like we used to do with the uh, online group. Um, so that will really help us out. We get a vegetable box, but the supermarket weekly one, obviously taking it in turns and contributing any what you can will be super, super helpful. And uh, your practice, your practice. And it's just very wonderful to see you all from every corner of the world. So thank you for coming. And um, <clears throat> thank you to Venable Pekka for being here. Many of you might not have met her before, but now you have. And it's really wonderful to have your input in these groups as well as your presence in the Vihara is very wonderful. So <laughs> do come down and, and meet us. I know some of you are. Um, we're getting kind of tight for space, it's true. So, and also the guest uh, rooms are pretty full. So, but we still hope to see you for Dana now and then. All right. So please take care and make every moment count. Shall we unmute you? <laughs>